Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's show. Um, I'm here with Professor Sophie Grace. Um, and your camera, unfortunately, wasn't working. Um, so we had some technical issues beforehand, but we're going to make do with things as they are. So um, do you want to tell people just a little bit about yourself and your background um, before I get into some kind of like more specific questions that I have for you? Um, so just like, you know, what you do, who you are. Sure, Nathan, and thanks for having me on. Well, I'm Professor of Philosophy at the Open University, which is based in Milton Keynes, although I actually live in Scotland. And I've been at the Open University since 2006. And I've been uh, writing and teaching and publishing on a variety of things. Ethics, uh, my most recent book, in, book on ethics is Epiphanies, which came out in March this year, and which is about an anti-theoretical approach to ethical problems. That means instead of trying to shoehorn the reality that we experience into the system of a theory, we go the other way about and we say, well, we'll use whatever bits of theoretical understanding we can, wherever they turn out to be useful, but um, it's going to be lived experience that has the upper hand in this relationship. And, I like the um, sound of that personally. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I hope it works out. So we need to focus on um, our ethical experience, not upon our ethical theory. And then when we do that, there are lots of things, of course, that we could focus in on. The whole point of my approach is that you don't take one thing and make it the master factor, the single key um, criterion of everything else and the only thing that matters. That's exactly what you don't do. But one of the things that turns out to be important is what I call epiphanies, moments, wow moments, if you like, moments when you just see um, something that really gets you to an understanding of ethical value, um, I think in a way that, that can't really come any other way. So that's what I do. Um, and I also do work on Plato. I work, do work on political philosophy. I do work on feminist philosophy. And um, at the moment, what I'm doing is I'm writing two books. One, one of them is about friendship and the other is about uh, transgender and the transgender experience, which is something I've always known about, but I've only been openly transgender since 2014. So I was hoping today to sort of interview you on um, some of your experiences, you know, being a trans person, also being a philosopher. So, you know, you'll have um, some things to say about kind of contemporary political issues or philosophical issues, I think, that are involved with being trans. And also as a Christian as well, because I think a lot of people um, who are Christians kind of struggle to understand or make sense of, of trans issues and i thought you know getting your voice out there on these different issues would be um it, well would be beneficial for a lot of people because they've probably not heard someone like you talking about these things so if if you wouldn't mind could you sort of describe for people first what the experience of being a trans person is like in the first place right well um yes and i i think as i say i think experience is the right place to start because what's typically supposed about trans people today in the mainstream press. People form this impression, which doesn't seem to be based as far as I can make out, with any actual, on, on any actual interaction with actual trans people. But people form this idea that there's something that we've got, which is called gender identity theory or gender ideology. And the, the idea seems to be that we, we read a book by Judith Butler and we think, oh, that's an impressive and interesting theory. I think I'll start wearing skirts and put um, pronouns in my footer and and asked to go by she he instead of he him um, as, as some kind of political statement and it's it's not about that at all um, one of the sections of the book I'm writing transfigured is why there is no is called why there is no such thing as gender ideology or at least not in the sense you meant um, and another group is called why there is no such thing as gender confusion, or at least not in the sense that you meant. And I was thinking this morning, looking over what I've got written for Transfigured, uh, which is about 86,000 words at the moment, and is waiting for a decision from OUP. I hope I'll accept it, uh, fingers crossed. I was thinking maybe we should have a section called why there is no such thing as gender identity, or at least not in the sense that you suppose. Because the story that's going around, I find, um, in the media at large, is that I believe, people like me believe, in something mysterious called gender identity, which is separate from um, my, uh, my biological sex and which can be in opposition to it. 
Now, of course, it all depends what you mean by this sort of claim, but it often seems like the idea is that there's some big fancy highfalutin theory here. Um, and on the basis of that fancy highfalutin theory, we often get the accusation um, that if you are transgender, then you must believe in some kind of dualism. So you, you think you've got um, a mind which is feminine and a body which is masculine or right. vice versa. Now, um, that seems to me to be a succession of attempts to explain by way of theory what's actually going on in experience. So it's the same thing again. It's experience theory clash. Um, and all of that, sorry, is a rather long winded way of, of getting to the point that I actually want to no, make okay. about what it's like uh, to be transgender, which is that you find there's this pronounced, uh, th this profound disconnect between the way you know your body is and um, the way you're shaped and the way you're um, formed in society, the way the way you're enculturated um, into gender norms and the way that the world seems to you and the way that you your own sense of yourself um, goes. And it goes contrary to the way you appear to be. Um, you find that you desperately want to be um, both sexed and gendered otherwise. You, you desperately want to have the other kind of body, the, the female body if you're born male or assigned male at birth, and the male body if you're uh, born female or assigned female at birth. So being trans is being in that condition. It's the experience of um, things not matching up, your sense of yourself, your sense of who you are, um, and the kind of body that you have, and your, your wishes, what you want to be, um, who you want to be. You you find that you don't want to be um, that male bloke that you see in the mirror. You want to be um, completely different from that. You want to be something which is, in a sense, the opposite of that, namely female and feminine. Now, that's just an experience which lots of people have, approximately 0.6% of the population, in a fairly stable way, have this experience. That's how they find things are for themselves. That they they just they look in the mirror and they go, no. They look in the mirror and go, no, that's not me. Um, I am something different from that. And 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 here's the bit that I think people aren't getting. At this point, you could say, and here's a fancy theory to explain how that is and why that is. And then you trundle on some fancy theory, and that's your theory of, of gender identity or ideology. But what I want to say is actually that move, that that move is a next move. It's a separate move. And you can make that move. And then you have got an explanation or a purported explanation of why things are like this for you. But you don't have to go that way. And any attempt you make to go that way could, I suppose, theoretically go wrong. Um, for example, sometimes people say, well, I, I think I'm transgender because I was a woman in a previous life. Um, and, and that certainly is a dualistic kind of view. You're saying that some kind of mind or spirit has been um, tipped into this body here, whereas previously it was tipped into a female body. And the trouble with this explanation, I mean, I'm, I'm not a dualist in that sense. I don't believe that kind of mind-body dualism. That's one problem with it. If that's your theory of gender identity, then it gets you into dualism. It also gets you into a kind of regress. Because let's suppose that I, I say that I am, uh, I'm, I'm transgender because I was Cleopatra in a past life. OK, well, what was Cleopatra in a past life? Um, so the theory, it seems to me, doesn't actually explain what it's trying to explain. And what it's trying to explain maybe doesn't need explanation in that kind of theoretical sense. It's just the experience of saying, well, I'm, I'm not happy this way. This isn't me. This isn't how I should be. Um, I should be. I, I should have the other kind of body. I should be recognised socially as the other kind of being. That's what um, I need for reasons that I can't fully articulate or explain. What I need is the other shape of body, and the other kind of um, social status, the other kind of social role, the other kind of recognition. Um, and finding that you have that want and that need, two things about it. First of all, it's absolutely basic. Um, it's it's something that isn't it isn't a whim. 
it's fundamental to the way that you are. And secondly, um, going along with its being basic, it's it's absolutely life wrecking for transgender people to try and ignore that sense of themselves as being um, in some sense meant to be in the other gender from which they were assigned at birth. And th there are, of course, many things you might try to do about someone who feels like this. Um, it's a stable result of uh, psychiatric practice over about at least the last century. It's a stable result that the best way to treat people who have this desire this to live in the other sex, this feeling that they belong in the other sex, it's a stable result about them that the best way to treat this, this desire, this sense, is to let those people express it, is to let those people live that life. Um, it's not something that can be uh, magicked away, talked away, um, therapeutized away. Conversion therapy doesn't work for trans people, it just makes them miserable. And in some cases leads to such extreme misery that they end up suicidal. So um, the best way to live with this is to go with it and to express it and to be who you find in the depths of your being that you truly are. Now, if that's a theory of gender identity, then OK, I have a theory of gender identity. But like I say, what, what I think we don't really have is an explanation of why some people are like this. And um, we, we don't have a neurological or physiological explanation of that. We don't have a philosophical explanation of it either. And I'm not clear that we need one. What we need is to be nicer to each other. I certainly uh, can get on board with that last point and, and the points as well about people listening to you know, what the medical evidence has to say about the best treatments and so forth. Um, so I, I have a question then that I suppose is going to touch slightly on theory, because le similarly to you, I want to put the emphasis on, um, you know, the kind of experiences that people have. But I do see sort of perhaps assumptions about the way the world is um, driving the kind of discourse around trans issues. So, so some people, for example, will um, resist the idea that um, trans people um, actually genuinely do adopt, you know, the, a, a particular identity because they have a kind of essentialist view of what it is to be male or female. Or similarly, some people who are trans will, um, you know, talk about kind of the, the identity that they're, they're adopting as kind of, you know, this essential, essential to who they are. And I wonder, you know, how, how much do you see kind of essentialist accounts of terms like male or female as being a part of this discourse or driving which direction it goes in? Um, or, for, you know, someone like me who views most of these terms as sort of socially constructed or culturally contingent, I'm like, I'm perfectly fine with people adopting different kind of um, uses of language and things like that, or deconstructing them in different ways. But I wondered what your, your views are as um, a trans person who's, well, you know, gone through that. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a very interesting um, string of questions. I mean, essential is an interesting word here because um, what the, I think what the transgender person is saying is it is essential for me to live in the opposite gender from the one I was born in. That's essential for me. So, But in essential that, in like an imperative sense, yeah. you mean that? Yeah. Yes, that's right. It's imperative for me to do this. And I think in that sense, um, I do think, um, changing your gender is something that's essential for us. Now, of course, I'm 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 making a pun here because um, we both know quite well that essentialist in philosophy doesn't refer to that colloquial sense of essential meaning imperative for me. In, essential for me meaning imperative for me. It refers to a theory that there's an essence um, to being male or female, and that that essence is unchangeable over time, and is what determines whether you really are a male or a female. So we, we get this cropping up in the question that politicians keep being tripped up by at the moment. What is a woman? It's interesting, of course, that the the stress of the um, polemic is always on the question, what is a woman? No one seems to be asking, what is a man? Yeah, that is um, true. <laughs> now, um, let's start right back in the philosophy of science. In the philosophy of science, it seems to me quite generally, um, there are facts about causal relations 
there are facts about explanatory relations which are as bedrock and as out there and as part of the furniture of the world as anything can get to be. But as soon as we start constructing a scientific theory, um, we start being selective. So there are different ways in which the philosophy of science, uh, sorry, there are different ways in which the activity of science can go. Um, and I think one interesting question to ask about alien cultures, alien species, is what does it take for them to have a science? Quite generally, what, what counts as them having a science? More specifically, what counts as them having a physics? Um, what is it for aliens to do physics? Would their physics necessarily be anything like ours? And let's suppose that these aliens live in the same um, universe as us, this actual universe that we, we've got right here. To what extent, um, this isn't a question I have an answer to, um, or not a complete answer to, to what extent would a, an alien physics necessarily be like ours? To what extent would it fail to be a physics if it wasn't like ours? And I think that's a question um, which is interesting because it reveals the, the gap between um, the, the extreme um, diversity of the, of the actual scientific facts and the very small selection of those scientific facts that people um, grip onto and claim, um, particularly when they're making the rhetorical claim, this is science, mate. This is yes. what you have to believe. You can't get away from this. So uh, to apply that general thought about the way in which the practice of science and the, what we count as an explanation in science or a causal sequence in science is already pre-selected by the history of our tradition of doing science and by the ways in which we already think about things. To apply that to um, biological sex, well, um, the more you look at it, the more the, the actual scientific facts get really complicated and the harder it gets to say um, what it actually is to be, um, well, not even a woman or a man, because those are clearly socially um, um, modulated, socially um, freighted terms. The biological terms are male and female. So what's the right. criterion of being male or female? When you get to that, um, I think the best thing to say is that you get to cluster concepts. Um, there are a whole range of different scientifically observable facts that you might rely on if you wanted to define what is a female. Um, and some of them would be uh, DNA chromosomes, some would be reproductive role, some would be uh, anatomy, some would be um, phenotypical, some would be genotypical, um, some of them would be, uh, I mean, uh, social facts can be part of science, so it can be a social fact that someone is recognised as being female in society just to be a social fact, so just as it could be a scientific fact that in a, a Bonobo troop, this matriarch here is the is is the the one who's in charge of the group. So you've got a, a cluster of different criteria for counting as female, um, and those the, the criteria in those cluster in that cluster, not one of them is the criterion, which is all or nothing, um, because people who are phenotypically female um, can have male DNA. That is a scientific possibility. When that happens, you see at once that you can't say that DNA is the, the be-all and end-all criterion of being male or female. It's not that simple. Um, DNA chromosomes don't divide up that neatly. So to, to say what is female or what is male, you have to be selective on any account. You have to be selective. You have to draw some lines in rather fuzzy material about saying, right, this, this is what counts as being male or being female. Um, you have to make some selections. And what you certainly can't do um, is what a lot of gender critical people do and say both that a cluster account of male and female is true and also that biological sex is immutable. Because go back to the criteria I mentioned a minute ago, um, ability to give birth, you might say, was a criterion of being female. Well, um, that means that being female is not immutable because there are possible scientific um, advances under which a male person could give birth. Um, and that uh, technology, that medical technology, I believe is quite not, not that far ahead of us in the, uh, in the stream of poss scientific possibility. So if possibilities like that are actually realized, and if we accept a cluster account of what it is to be female, then we ought to say that people 
can there can now be people who who are related to that cluster in a different way from before and so one natural way natural thing to say about this is it's now possible for people to be female in a sense that it wasn't possible for them to be female before and it's possible for femaleness to be mutable in a way that wasn't possible before so against all of that um that kind of richness of possibility and, and variability, you've got a lot of interpretive possibilities too about what you do with these data, what you say about them. And what I think really won't do is to say that it's it's just a scientific fact that biological sex is immutable. That, that clearly isn't the case. Biological sex is mutable. It can be changed already in some respects, for example, hormone levels, um, gross anatomy, um, phenotypical anatomy, those can be changed. Um, in future, more scientific developments may make other changes possible. So the position that biological sex is immutable is a dogma. Um, it's not a view that we necessarily have to take at all. And all of this is a way of sneaking up, a rather long-winded way of sneaking up on the question, what is a woman, that uh, right-wing uh, pundits keep keep. Uh, ambushing politicians with, because the answer to what is a woman, in my view, is a woman is an adult female. But that just prompts the question, what is a female? And actually, what is a female is a more complicated question than um, people are allowing. Um, and incidentally, a woman is an adult female. That's not a scientific definition either, because adult um, in this in this, uh, in this phrase, adult female, adult is a social term and a legal term. It's not a biological term. If it was a biological term, then the only thing it could mean would be uh, sexually mature. And I don't think anyone with any sense or discretion is going to say that people are women the moment they're sexually mature, because that would mean counting 12-year-olds or some 12-year-olds as women. So um, all of that, in answer to your question, um, I, I think these things are more complicated than people allow. There's more variability than people allow. And it's it's not it's not a good look when people claim in the names of, name of science to be defending the scientific facts. And actually, what they do is they um, they grab hold of a dogma, they grab hold of one um, non compulsory way of interpreting the scientific facts, and say this is the scientific reality. And anyone who denies this is in denial about science. That won't stand up to scrutiny. Yeah, I, I do tend to agree with everything you said there. I think, um, you know, my my personal view, which obviously not everyone is kind of compelled to agree with, is that a lot of the terms used in the sciences are also kind of defined operationally rather than yes. them sort of dividing nature authentically at the joints sort of thing. And so, um, yeah, I, I find a lot of the attempts then to kind of almost bootstrap from kind of terms like male and female that might be used in a particular way in particular branches of the sciences into what we might mean by um in an ordinary sense when we talk about someone being a man or a woman um un unconvincing when people try and constrain those things in certain ways though something from my own view that i've thought about is the kind of anti uh, i i'd agree with you you know if a trans person is saying it's essential for them to um you know, express themselves or participate in society in a certain sense, I, you know, I, I agree with that. But I think sometimes when people talk about, you know, as if they've kind of discovered like a, a an inherent nature of who they are as a trans person or something, I think maybe I might disagree with that because I think I have a more, um, I, don't, I don't know, malleable view of the self or something like what, where I think that so, you know, these terms like like being trans, for example, is part of a linguistic practice that I, you know, I probably wouldn't know if I was a Sentinelese person or something like that. And I, I could kind of adopt that identity or I could abandon that identity, but because I'm not like essentially anything myself. And but I don't want to hold this opinion in a way where it kind of harms trans people as well. But that's just sort of genuinely what I think about people and language. I, I don't know if you have any thoughts on, you know, if this anti-essentialism kind of almost cuts against the political goals of trans people in some ways as well. I, I, th I think we're we're closer together than you perhaps imagine, Nathan, because okay. I think my view is that um, the scientific facts, as I say, the, the, the really identifiable scientific facts, the facts that we would have in common um, between terrestrial biology or physics or zoology and alien uh, biology or physics and, or zoology, the facts that we have in com common are 
really quite scattered and non-committal. And what we do is we build upon those scientific facts. First of all, a scientific theory of explanation. Explanation is already a matter of selection from the facts that are actually there, choosing which to boost, which suppress into the background, which matter explanatorily, which don't. Scientific explanation is itself already a cultural project. That is in no way a relativist statement on my part. It's, it's just um, that the, the culture you're in and the historical tradition of doing science that you're in really matter if you want to understand properly what it is to, to do science. Um, reality itself matters too, of course, but um, we're always in the business of interpreting reality. Reality is a constraint upon our interpretive activity, but so is the history of our interpretations in the past. So when you get to the level of um, terms like man, woman, and indeed cisgender and transgender, you're dealing in what ethicists call thick concepts. You're dealing in terms which have a, 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 a factual constraint built into them. You know, you, you, can't be, you can't be a man if you're a coffee table. You can't be a woman if you're, to reference a familiar jibe, you can't be a woman if you're an attack helicopter. There are some constraints built into this activity of understanding. Nonetheless, man and woman are both ethically thick concepts. They come, as, as lots of feminists have been pointing out for donkey's years, they come with an ideological loading of expectations about what it is to be a man or a woman. And Kipling's famous poem, If, is a good example of this. Um, if you do blah de blah de blah whatever it is that happens in If, we don't need to rehearse it now, then, last line, um, then you'll be a man, my son. That's the crucial upshot of being someone who feels the unforgiving worth, the, the, the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distance run. Um, or to reach for a more recent example, and a song which I must say I really dislike for precisely this kind of ideological loading reason, uh, Just Like a Woman by Bob Dylan. Um, she makes love just like a woman, she fakes love just like a woman, but she, she breaks just like a little girl, or however it goes. Um, that's perhaps my least favourite Bob Dylan song, because I, I think it's deeply sexist. But it brings out that whatever you do with the word woman, you're still dealing with a thick concept. Um, and unless you uh, in, engage in some kind of conceptual, um, you know, um, Pol Pot style revolution, it would be very difficult just to create a year zero with these terms, to, to burn everything down and start again completely would be very hard. And I'm more of a gradualist than that myself. In some sense, I do think that we need to reconsider very carefully what we do with man and woman as thick concepts, the ideology that they um, import into every situation that we use them. We need to think about that. Same with male and female, which are thick terms too. Um, and with transgender. Yes, you're absolutely right. Being transgender in our society um, is a particular kind of thick concept. We have the concept of trans man and trans woman, and we have some in implicit understanding of how those concepts work. And famously, there are other societies where there are hedras or, or two-spirit people or whatever they call them, I, I forget right now in Thailand, um, where the concepts of the genders are differently structured and articulated. And that's exactly what you'd expect, given that you're dealing with different traditions. It brings us back to that question of philosophy of science, how deep down do you have to dig before you get what has to be the same between two anthropologies for them still to be scientific anthropology? But just, I'm, I'm answering very long answers today. I apologize for that. It's okay, but don't one, worry. One last thing to say on this. Um, I, get, I share, for all the reasons I've just been laying out, your skepticism about the idea that there is one um, essentialist way to be about pretty much anything, I think that's mistaken. I think all our being is historical um, as human beings. I think human beings are by, by definition, as uh, Pico della Mirandola said, um, human beings are the creature that by definition, um, his essence, his, his essence, said Pico della Mirandola, is, is um, to define his own essence. That's what humans do. Um, or to put it in a way that Aris Murdoch put it, man, uh, Again, forgive the gendering. Man is the creature who makes a picture of himself in art and then begins to resemble the picture. We do that. We're very reflexive creatures and we're always in that reflexive relation to our own thick concepts. 
And that's okay, that's neither good nor bad. What matters is the conceptual engineering of the thick concepts to make sure we're working with the right ones. Um, so being transgender, I, th I think there can be moments where, um, well, actually epiphanies about being transgender, you, you suddenly see it. It suddenly comes together for you and you think, actually, this is who I am. Actually, this fits with everything that's been going on. There's been all this chaos and confusion in my experience and I haven't understood it. But now here is a concept that enables me to understand who I am. That's the thing that can happen. And we needn't be too absolutist about it and say, well, um, that's the only way you could possibly understand yourself because obviously different cultures have different understandings. But without being too absolute, uh, absolutist about it, we don't have to be too relativistic about it either and say, well, this is just an illusion of discovery. Well, no, it's not, not necessarily. And saying that it's culturally um, bound and historically conditioned is not saying that it can't be a genuine insight. I mean, after all, seeing, I mean, here's, here's an analogy, seeing the correct chess move on the board in front of you um, can be a genuine insight, but that too is historically and culturally conditioned. Chess is an invention. Um, whatever Martians do, they almost certainly don't play chess. So I've got a couple more questions for you and then we can move into audience Q&A if there's time. So um, kind of changing gears slightly from, well, I suppose it could still be slightly philosophical. I wondered as, as a trans person, what your views are on the contemporary political discourse. Um, so if you wanted to share your thoughts on any particular issues, um, you know, what like people talk a lot about like toilets, prisons and sports basically, um, and how, you know, how trans pe people kind of integrate with these things. But I also wondered if you wanted to share your experience about how um, seeing this discourse talked about by politicians or um, in newspapers sort of affects you as a trans person as well. Um, it's enormously damaging and it's very hurtful uh, what's going on in the UK at the moment. And um, I predicted in a podcast I did about Scottish independence in 2018, I predicted that um, everything would go wrong with Brexit and that when it did, then our government would go into looking for scapegoats and distractions and, and dead cats and anything, you know, oh, look, a squirrel, anything to avoid having to talk about the disasters consequent upon Brexit and upon their own incompetence. And I, I wish I wasn't such a good prophet, um, because at the risk of saying, I told you so, I told you so. Um, I was far righter than I realised at the time in that prediction. And in particular, I was far righter than I realised. I might have emigrated if I'd realised about the way in which trans people would be the go-to scapegoat for the government and the go-to distraction for the government. And that, I think, is precisely what's happening in the UK in one way and in the US in another. Um, and the, the end point of these attacks on trans people, both in the US and in the UK, the end point is, is not simply to make us disappear, to erase or eliminate trans people, um, either to frighten us back into the closet so there are no publicly visible trans people, or um, to use actual violence against us. I think the latter is a real possibility now, I'm afraid. Um, I, I think the end point is, is not actually trans elimination. The end point is complete control. The end point is um, a handmaid's tale. And I think this is now very clear in the US, where the US is tragically fracturing in front of our eyes into a red US and a blue US. It is becoming like The Handmaid's Tale, where the only way to live, if if you're a woman in The hand, Handmaid's Tale, is to get the hell out to Canada. If you can get across the border, that's safety. It's getting like that in the US. Um, but the end point, like I say, is not trans elimination. We're much too small a target. We're useful. Trans people are being used to um, get people used to the idea of this kind of dramatic interference with people's personal autonomy and people's life choices. In the land of the free, for God's sake, um, that's what's happening right now. And the end point, as we've just seen, is to ratchet it up from controlling trans people in that way, next to controlling um, women's reproductive freedom, to controlling people's choice of a, a sexual identity, whether to be gay or straight or, or bi or, or none of the above. Um, and the end game is in, in a word, I think it's fascism. The end game is complete control 
by the autocrats of everybody else's private choices. Um, so we are, we, it's often said that trans people are a canary in the mind because when things are bad for us, that's a sign that things are going badly for everybody. But I think we probably passed the point where the poor old canary has asphyxiated. I think we're already at the point where the miners are getting pretty unwell as well. Um, so uh, that, that's extremely bleak and um, um, dis, 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 uh, dystopian, dystopian of me. I don't think the situation is irreversible, but I do think that uh, people need to wake up and see what's happening to everybody um, with this constant targeting and scaremongering of trans people. Um, there is a real danger to everybody's liberties and we need to wake up and do something about it. With with regard to the sort of particular political issues that some people express concern about, so um, I often hear people talking about, you know, like um, how people who might be predators could self-identify as the opposite gender and go into a sort of female-only space and and harm people that way. I mean, how how do you respond as a trans? Is this a concern that you share as a trans person, or do you think that it's kind of um, a point that's so overblown? How how do you respond to those? Um, I think people like Kathleen Stock raise these points. Well, these points are endlessly raised um, as a way of um, scaremongering against trans people. And you can do it with any group you like. I mean, let's take people from Gloucester. I think people from Gloucester should um, be treated as a high-risk group, and we should not allow them anywhere near children without adequate safeguarding. Because after all, Fred and Rose West were from Gloucester. Um, we need to deal with the Gloucester menace, the, the Gloucester danger to people, um, um, you know, of a certain age, uh, to young people. There are real safeguarding problems around people from Gloucester. You, you can pick any group you like. You can profile them. You might even be able to find some cases where people from that group have done terrible thing. this kind of things, and, and that will help you get your, your scaremongering program going. Um, it is scaremongering and it is profiling, and it's very much analogous to previous scaremongerings that have been done against black people, against Jewish people, against gay people. Um, all of this has happened before, and my own inclination, like some other people who, who speak out for trans rights, my, my own inclination is to say, look, um, can we please change the subject? This is not a useful way to talk. This is not a helpful way to talk. This is vilifying a minority. Um, on the basis of essentially no evidence whatsoever that trans people as such are any kind of threat to other people. Um, actually, trans people are far more likely to be targeted by violent means um, in, the, in, in public toilets themselves, and it's much more likely that the results of any attempt to police uh, bathrooms in public, it's much more likely that, that will lead to violence against uh, people whose appearance is non-standard, who may well be cis. Um, so I, I think what we need to do is change the conversation away from that to talking about the kinds of oppression that we all experience in a society like ours. We need to be talking about housing. We need to talk, be talking about employment. We need to be talking about the way in which um, this government and this whole ethos that we've got in the UK is all about dividing those who are powerless and impecunious against each other. It's all about getting us to hate each other so a different group can stay in charge. And I, I think it's very naive of people who call themselves feminists to go along with this kind of thing. And uh, there's so much mendaciousness around the subject too. The idea that it's something new that trans people use, the trans women use women's facilities, um, that's utterly mendacious. That's what trans women have always done. Where, where do they think we went if we wanted to go for a pee? In 1940, of course, trans women used the ladies. Um, and it's it's mendacious and it's hurtful. And it also involves another kind of mendaciousness because there's this myth going around, which far too many people are promoting, that the Gender Recognition Act, um, which is proposed by the Scottish Parliament, um, by the SNP and the Greens, and I'm, I'm very pleased to say it's certain that they'll get that through, along with a ban on conversion therapy, which is all great. But there's this idea going round, this meme going round, that the Gender Recognition Act will allow trans people, uh, trans women, suddenly to start using the ladies. And that's just utter nonsense. The GRA is nothing to do with um, public restrooms. 
um, we already have the right to be there, codified in law in the Equality Acts 2004, 2010. Before that, there was a, a common law presumption that trans women could do that. There wasn't any law about it, but every, everybody knew that that was what happened and no one had a big problem with it. Um, gender recognition, the Gender Recognition Act is about your identity documents, for God's sake. It's about your passport and your driving license and the NHS records, records on you. No one presents credentials before they use the loo in, in uh, hotels or, or pubs or, or you know, railway stations or whatever. No one presents their documents before they use the loo. And what kind of society would we have become if, if we became a society where you did do that? So the whole thing is a distraction. It's a series of distractions and smears and lies. So my final question for you then is going to be about how being trans kind of intersects with you being a Christian and also your understanding of theology. So um, I talk to a lot of Christians and I used to be a Christian myself and some of the Christians, most of the Christians who watch my channel, I think will be, you know, very supportive of someone like you um, and, and have a theology that kind of encompasses that. But a lot of the people that I talk to, um, will sort of have a religious basis for kind of justifying some of their prejudices that they might have against trans people. Um, so I wondered if you could sort of speak to some of those religious based prejudices that people might have against trans people as a trans person, and then kind of articulate how your theology, you know, makes sense of you being a trans person and, uh, and how that all fits in uh, with your religious commitments. Well, I'm, I am a Christian and I always have been and once upon a time, I was an evangelical, and I'm always um, I'm always strangely moved by the sight of evangelicals attempting to use scripture to justify their view that being gay or being trans, that either of those things, is uh, some kind of unforgivable sin and some kind of special sin. Um, there are certainly bits in scripture that it is possible to understand as saying that um, it is a sin to be gay. There, there certainly are bits of scripture that say that. But how does, let's stick with being gay for a moment, how does being gay become this um, enormous, unmentionable, particularly dreadful sin? The New Testament, to go no further than that, um, invades at enormous length against wealth, against violence, against cruelty to others, um, particularly wealth, perhaps. To come away from the New Testament and think that the, the thing that it says is the greatest sin of all is being gay. Um, I have no time for, for example, the entirety of the letter of James or much of the teaching of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mountain shortly after. Um, all, all of that is about being rich. Why isn't being rich the special sin? Why don't we have a taboo about rich people? Why don't we think that rich people are specially evil and dreadful and we must drive them away from our churches? And I think the clue to the answer is uh, the word I just used, taboo. Uh, we, we think about richness. Um, typical evangelicals think about richness, um, conservative evangelicals, I mean, think about richness as a matter of degree and so, um, and some of them think too that if you're rich, that's a sign that God has blessed you, which is, when you think about it, a pretty callous thing to say to the poor. Um, being rich is is a matter of degree, and it's okay to be a bit rich, um, but we don't make a taboo out of that. Whereas being gay is the breaching of a taboo, and people go enormously primitive in anthropological terms. This becomes uncleanness. This becomes a thing that must be driven out of the community. So that's how they think about um, being gay. And they they hammer endlessly on the same tiny selection of texts because there's nothing else to go on. With being trans, their situation is even worse um, because the exegetical basis for saying that it's a sin to be transgender is simply non-existent. Um, it just isn't there in the Bible. The Bible does not say at any point that it is wrong to um, find yourself wishing you lived um, in the other sex and gender and doing everything you can to achieve that. The Bible never says that that's wrong. Um, it doesn't say a word about it. And so there's an extraordinary disproportion here. There's a wonderful website, which I, I implore you to go away and look up called God Hate Shrimp, which is saying to people who are conservative evangelical gay bashers, well, you know, if you're so keen on that bit of Deuteronomy, 
What about the other bits of Deuteronomy? What about the dietary laws? Why is it just being gay that gets your attention in this fashion? So there's all of that to say about the supposed doctrinal basis for hating gays, um, excluding gays and excluding trans people. And the bases are very similar. It's supposed to be an appeal to scripture, which the more you look at it, the more desperate it gets. Then on the experiential front, I mean, I bought the cultural assumption um, that homosexuality and being transgender were both sins. I bought that cultural assumption myself as a young evangelical. And it's part of my story that I spent years praying to God to help me to fight that, that wicked evil side of myself. And over about six weeks in 1998, um, if you'll forgive my, the presumption of my putting it this way, I think that I had it revealed to me that it's no sin at all. And it's the way I'm meant to be. And that's how God wants me to be. And I can best achieve. Um, I can best work out my salvation in fear and trembling by letting myself be that person. And that that six weeks for me was like the ending of a civil war. I stopped fighting myself and I became someone who accepted the nature that she's been given by God and started trying to live in that nature instead of to suppress it and destroy it and, and fight it down. And I can only say to other people who might find themselves in that situation that um, you need to listen very carefully to what God is actually saying to you, because the time might not be right for you where you are right now to hear that actually this isn't a mistake at all and that you're meant to be like that. I mean, for me, it didn't happen until I was 33. Um, the time might not be right yet, but but keep listening and don't assume that you've got it right, because maybe you will find that actually um, what God wants for you is quite different from what you imagine. And if if that happens, then I think you'll find that it's infinitely better to live in harmony with your own nature and not to fight against it. And it enables you to concentrate on the great matters of the law. It enables you to concentrate on the things that really matter, like... Um, justice and fairness and peace and the protection of each other and human solidarity and protecting the environment those are the things that really matter what people do with their genitals is is really a very secondary matter and what people do with their gender expression is really a very secondary matter and it's curious that people fixate on this perhaps because it's easier to control yeah i i in my mind i think that's what it is i i see generally um, the religious communities that tend to take issue with these sorts of things tend to be quite high control communities. And I, I see it as being, you know, so part of the kind of high control system is sort of giving people deep guilt and shame feelings, you know, around sex and and, and things like that. Um, and it, so that that's sort of my assessment, but I don't know if there's any kind of empirical basis for that you know well, to, to yes I, I think that's right and i think it's often associated with a, a deeply unhealthy cult of the leader i think the cult of the leader is a very big thing in the evangelical church and they set up gurus who the idea of the the guru the idea of the charismatic pastor um in one sense or another or charismatic is that this is the person who can set you right this is the person whose intermediacy you need to get you right with god ironically enough when you think what the reformation was all about um and if you just follow this pastor then you'll be fine that puts the pastor in a position of control over his flock which is enormously tempting to the psychologically and indeed sexually manipulative and and financially manipulative too and there are endless stories about where that leads um i'm lucky enough to be a member of the scottish episcopalian church which is of course like any church far from perfect but one good thing about the the SEC is how very unhierarchical it, it is. My, the, the chap who used to be uh, the priest in charge at my own parish church used to joke that if we had a, a wayside pulpit, then ours would have to read, fed up of organised religion, come along to all souls in Vigaro and experience disorganised religion. Right. <laughs> Well, th yeah, thank you for sharing your experiences on all these things. So we've got some questions in from the chat, um, but we we are coming up to about the hour mark now. Do you think you've got time to answer a few of them? Um, Absolutely. For 10 minutes or so? Okay. Um, so the first question then was from Luke, which is, uh, in a population of traditionally trans people, would a traditionally cis person be considered trans? <laughs> I see what you're getting at there, Luke. What an interesting question. Um, 
as it happens, I try to imagine what it would be like if you had a world where where being a woman was the norm, um, uh, whether cis or trans, being a woman would be the norm in that society. And men would be pe people who are, you know, overtly and evidently cis men would be a kind of exception to that. And, and so perhaps a traditionally cis man in that society, which I call listeners, incidentally, and it's, I've, I've got it on my academia edu page and it's coming out as part of the transfigured book so people who insist on presenting as cis men and aren't either biologically born female or don't take the opportunity to to present as as female that that society offers them and takes to be the norm in that society traditional cis men are well they're not considered trans but they're certainly considered a kind of outlier and a slightly peculiar and somewhat stigmatized outlier so the idea of listeners is the society where being a woman is the norm and where being a man is being an outlier. So it's, it's not a utopia. It's not a perfect place. It's a place where things are stood on their head rather than made absolutely wonderful and, and dream world perfection. And of course, one interesting case in listeners is what happens to trans men. What happens to them? Because they, they are born with the, the, the approved biology, that of women. And unlike trans women, they don't have to make an effort to opt into the category woman. On the contrary, they make an effort to opt out of it into the somewhat stigmatized category of men. So they look like the, the trans men in Le Sunes, uh, this, this Ursula Le Guin science fiction-ish kind of world that I imagined. The trans men look like they're the ones who are having the hardest time. Um, I, I hope I've got what you were getting at with your question, Luke. I think it's a really interesting question. And, and here's the point. We can imagine completely different social orders. That's the really interesting thing here. It's not just Ursula Le Guin and other science fiction writers who can imagine completely different configurations of our gender and sex ideas. We can all do that. And when we do imagine it, the results can be very interesting, I think. So uh, YouTube Punk asks, does Sophie classify herself as a gender abolitionist? And it might be worth kind of prefacing that with what you take gender abolitionist to mean. Well, gender abolitionism is the view that all gender roles are harmful and restrictive and, and put us in cages. Um, and I've, I've had exchanges in the past with people who describe themselves as gender abolitionists. Um, quite often, gender abolitionists are also... Um, what the, what they call gender critical uh, feminists. Um, I would want to pause over the term gender critical. I think I'm deeply gender critical. I'm, my whole life is about criticising uh, norms of gender and saying, well, well, what do we do with them? Um, suppose l let me back the question back to YouTube punk like this. Um, suppose you had um, someone who was a an etiquette abolitionist. They said there, sh there should be no such thing as man as manners in our society. There should be no such thing as rules about how to behave and present yourself in social situations. Now, we could understand that proposal in two ways. And one is to take it as being, um, you know, just a just a crusade against flummery. And we might think that's a good thing that, you know, no one actually cares whether you start with the, the knife and fork on the outside or the knife and fork on the inside or the, or the one in the middle. No one cares. It doesn't matter. Do what suits yourself. Um, and in that sense, you might be an etiquette, but abolitionist and, and everyone perhaps would applaud that. But there's another sense of etiquette, a bit abolitionist or manners abolitionist that I think would leave us a bit at sea because it turns out that we have conventions for all sorts of things in society. So when you walk into a room with someone you've never met before, there are norms of manners and courtesy, and if you like etiquette, that condition what you will then do. You'll say, hi, good to meet you, Nathan, how are you doing? Um, and notice that in America, this, this last question, um, etiquette wise, it does not require an answer, an answer is not right. expected. Um, so there's all kinds of stuff going on about social performance, about how we present ourselves to each other, which actually I think goes very deep into our society. And I think it's a kind of existentialist myth to think that you can have a society where there are no norms about how we present ourselves to each other. That just seems to me to be false as a matter of human anthropology. As a matter of human anthropology, we need some norms about how to present ourselves to each other. 
So I think the answer to your question, YouTube punk, is that I'm a moderate gender abolitionist. I think that gender most certainly should not be a cage, shouldn't be used to bully people or browbeat them or make them feel small in the way that rules about knives and forks. At a banquet, you start from the outside in or the inside out. Those kinds of rules can be used to bully and browbeat people, but I don't think that's the only way that social rules about etiquette can be used. And I think some of them actually make it very difficult for us to communicate at all, unless there's something there. I mean, think of another analogy. Um, is anyone a language abolitionist? You might say, well, language is so crude and clumsy. Do we have to use English words like crude and clumsy in communicating with each other? Why can't we just use a sequence of grunts and gestures and maybe music? That would be so much more vivid and that would get us away from this hidebound conformity to norms that others have invented. Well, language, um, like any other code or role that we adopt, language is something that can control us, that can master us, or that we can be in control of. Um, so we use the conventions of language, um, if, if we're doing it right, we use them in creative and constructive ways, and that's a good thing. Um, being a language abolitionist, what would that mean? Well, it might mean that you didn't think, for example, where it, you, you didn't think it mattered, for example, whether people say different than or different from. And at that level, you know, that's like the thing about the knives and forks, that is pedantry, which is used to control other people and put other people down. But on the other hand, if we didn't have some kind of language, um, our expressive resources would be severely limited. And I suppose I think that's my brief answer to the gender abolitionist question. Yes, I'm a gender abolitionist, if that means getting rid of constricting, absurd constricting systems, which impose um, anti-human demands and constraints upon people. Yes, absolutely, I'm against that. But perhaps gender is also a way through which we express ourselves. Perhaps gender is a kind of language. And perhaps in that sense, I'm not a gender abolitionist. How long my answers are today? I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Um, Jerome asked about your um, Christian denomination, but I think you already mentioned that. I don't know if you wanted yeah, to... Yeah, the Scottish Christian Episcopalian thing. Church, which is the Scottish equivalent of the Anglicans. Although we have a very different history because we're not the established church in Scotland. And um, after 1690, the Scottish Episcopalian Church was actually illegal in just the way the Catholic Church was illegal in Scotland until 1842. Um, so, uh, yes, I'm, I'm a Scottish Episcopalian, and that means being a slightly more um, anti-establishment person than being a Church of England person does, which, which I find temperamentally very agreeable. I think perhaps what I dislike most about the Church of England in which I was born is its association with the establishment and the House of Lords and all that malarkey. Right. Um, Albert Lucientes asks, uh, how does the professor feel about trans women playing in women's sports? Uh, even if I was trans, I'm pretty sure I'd be against it for obvious reasons. Uh, you don't see trans men cleaning up men's sports titles. Well, um, I tend to think that this issue um, can be taken two ways. And one of them is that it can be taken as a serious issue in its own right, where it is um, addressed in good faith by serious people who actually know some of the uh, physiological science involved. And the other is that it's, it's just used as yet another talking point in an attempt to um, shut trans people out. So um, there are so many questions here where we need to divide the issue to decide what we're actually talking about. Which sports, what level, which trans women, which trans men for that matter. Um, as you may or may not know, there was a state, I think it was Tennessee, where they just had one of these moral panics about trans people and have made it impossible for trans girls to play high school sport as girls. And it turned out that there was one child in the entire state of Tennessee whom this law actually affected because she was the only trans girl who was actually playing um, in a girls team in a high school. Now, that kind of thing, it just seems to me, is, is just more um, steamrolling of trans people. So trans people have the same right as anyone else to play school sports. And I think it's very important that they should be allowed to do that without stigmatisation. And in many cases, um, I think it's going to be the case that you are outing them or making an example of them if you refuse to allow them to do that. And I don't think that's healthy. Um, which women, which sports? On the which women side, um, it's also worth noting 
that there are different ways of being a trans woman. There are trans women who um, uh, haven't had surgery, don't intend to have surgery, um, haven't taken hormones, haven't done any of that. Um, and there are trans women who are on hormones. And so in sports like cycling, um, there are regulations about hormone levels. Um, and that's true in swimming as well, I believe. And you have to achieve some kind of balance that makes it possible for you to be, um, I, I think the default presumption is that you should be as inclusive as possible. Um, and there may well be cases where moving away from that default presumption is both necessary and indeed a matter of safety. And I think rugby is the obvious example, particularly the way that rugby is played these days. Rugby is a series, rugby union is a series of seismic collisions. And often in a rugby game, the whole point is to wear down the opposition by crashing into them in midfield until they can't carry on tackling you anymore. Um, now, in that situation, someone who has um, a trans woman's originally male um, physical background, the, the bone structure, the body mass, the muscle fiber, all of it, um, it's quite likely that trans women in rugby are going to cause significant damage if that kind of game of attrition is the style in which that particular rugby game is being played. But again, there are more complexities here because uh, looking down the line, anyone who is following rugby union can see that there are shortly going to be even more restrictions on how much impact and collision we allow in rugby because it turns out that um, you know, just being in a five or six uh, bone bone shattering tackles in a game, when the head isn't even targeted, that can cause you brain damage. And the more you do it, the more brain damage you get. So I think the highest impact sport I know of is probably rugby, either union or league. They're both pretty high impact. And it's likely that we're going to move away from playing it in such a high impact way in the interests of everybody who plays the game. So uh, my answer to Al Albert is that I don't have a single answer. I think it depends on which trans women you're talking about and which sport. Um, I mean, if, if the sport is completely non-contact and if the sport has nothing to do with physical size, strength, um, bone structure, weight, um, I, I can't see why, tr why trans people shouldn't be admitted on the same terms as everybody else. Um, and as I say, I think the default presumption has to be be as inclusive as you can. So um, why would you want a gender divide anyway in a sport like darts or a sport like archery? I can't really see it. Um, so the next question from Nidimus is, what does Sophie do with Romans 1, 26 to 27? Doesn't this rely upon a binary understanding of sexual expressions in human relations? I can bring up the uh, passage if you need uh, one second. I thought there was a Bible on this shelf. I'm just looking for a Bible. Um, I'm sure. I've got I've got it here on the screen. Um, if you you should be able to see it. Okay. Um, uh, can you yeah. see that? Okay. Yes, I can see that. Um, what what does what does Nidamas want me to say about this? I, I think he's saying that. Um, so, in he he's saying that this passage sort of indicates that there is um, a sexual binary. And I think this particular passage here, men committing shameless acts with other men, is like a, is, is a, a particular condemnation of homosexuality, for example. I think this was in response to, you know, some yeah. of the things you were say yeah, saying earlier. About yes, I'm, I'm slightly perplexed by the question, because um, one thing you might do with these two verses is say, um, well, what's going on here is that Paul is condemning um, homosexuality, uh, but the question doesn't appear, Nidamas's question doesn't appear to be about homosexuality. It, it appears to be about whether this passage implies that yeah. uh, St. Paul thinks that there are, are two sexes or two genders. Um, well, um, it probably does imply that Paul thinks that, yes, but that's not something that I've denied. I haven't denied that there is um, a gender bi binary um, or a sexual binary. Of course there is. Um, what I want to say is that uh, that binary is not entirely clear around the edges, and there are certainly marginal cases. And if you accept, as I do, um, a cluster concept 
of sex, of biological sex, then it's obvious how there can be um, marginal cases because you, the cluster concept of sex says that being male or female is determined by a list of criteria by satisfying a vaguely defined enough of those criteria to a vaguely defined sufficient degree. So obviously there can be intermediary cases between the two. They're not normal in the, in the, in the statistical sense. Most people are clearly male or clearly female, and most people are cis, not trans. Um, all of that's fine. I don't have any problem with that. In this passage, um, Paul is denouncing a whole sequence of features that he sees in um, the world around him, particularly in Greek and Roman culture. He's addressing the church at Rome and saying, um, these pagans go in for homosexuality and isn't that terrible? And um, my, my thought about this passage is, I suppose, primarily that it comes back to um, two things. First of all, um, why evangelicals are so focused on this passage rather than others in the New Testament. Why are we going on and on about Romans 1, 26 to 27, and almost completely ignoring the letter of James with its fierce denunciation of the rich in one chapter and of speech in another chapter? Why aren't we doing more silence? Because James tells us that the tongue is a terrible thing um, and leads us into all kinds of wickedness. Why aren't we being more silent and worrying more about speaking? Why don't we have to pay a fine every time we speak more than we should? Um, so it's selectiveness again, that we focus in on this and make this on our big shibboleth. Um, that's the first thing to say. The second thing is, what's your background um, um, attitude to scripture in general? What's your background hermeneutics of the Bible in general? My attitude to Paul is that Paul is like an older member of my church congregation who has a lot of very wise, very deep and profoundly helpful views. He also has, like many elderly members of many congregations, a few inexplicable crotchets and prejudices. And one of them is famously about um, women covering their heads in worship. Um, St. Paul, in a letter that is attributed to him as well, I think it's um, First Timothy, says that uh, the, 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 fall of, the fall of man, as it's usually called, is all Eve's fault. It's not Adam's fault. Remember that bit? So St. Paul says it, it was not man who first sinned, it was Eve who got it wrong, and she passed the apple to Adam, and it's all Eve's fault. Um, now, I think a healthy attitude to scripture in general is to remember that we are part of the same church that wrote it. And we're in conversation with scripture. We're deciding what to do with it. We're deciding um, what kind of authority we want to give it in our own lives. And St. Paul's um, attack here upon Roman homosexuality, if that's what it is, and I'm happy to grant that it is, I think needs to be said, seen in the context of that kind of attitude. If Paul happened to say something racist in one verse, I don't believe he does, but if he did, then my inclination would be the same as there. I would say, well, Paul is a master of so many things, he has so much to teach us, but this bit is not something that we can do anything with today, nor should we try to. This is a piece of guidance which may have made sense in his time and his place. It's not for us. And I think that's exactly what I'd say about women covering their heads in church, um, which Paul advocates. Slaves and masters would might be a good example. As well. Yes, yes. Um, so uh, I think you have to um, accept that the evangelical view of scripture as something which is absolutely binding on us and is at a completely different level to us, I think that view is simply not one that even evangelicals in practice actually follow. That's the real thing that's wrong with that view of scripture. Nobody actually believes that. In practice, nobody does that. Everyone selects. Everyone tries to make some sense of it using a theology and an ethics which is shaped by the spirit, shaped by the scripture, but does not therefore necessarily mean that every single line in it is something that we think we have to put into practice right now. It's not that simple. I, I don't know if you're into watching these sorts of things, but there was a discussion slash debate between William Lane Craig and James White um, earlier this year or late last year. 
and one of the main points that kept coming up um, was so J if you don't know who James White is, he's a, an American Calvinist, and you know uh -huh. he he likes to say, well, I, I I'm just saying you know what the Bible plainly says here, um, and one of the points Craig kept, I, and I'm not a big fan of Craig, but I, I liked him on this occasion. He kept bringing up how. Um, well, all the time we're building, you know, these theological models. And then he, ra he raised all these points about um, James White's Calvinism, for example, you know, saying about how, how um, none of these doctrines are, are just found in scripture, right? You have to kind of build yes. this theological, build up different theological models and evaluate and compare those models in different ways. And um, I think that's uh, something like that in your kind of hermeneutic is along the lines of what you're suggesting there. Um, whereas... A, a lot of people who have the kind of who, who will appeal to a passage like that, maybe to confirm certain prejudices they have, aren't taking that view. Um, they're coming to it with their prejudices, seeing the things they want to say and say, that's just plainly what the Bible says without yes. building, you know, models out of the whole thing. Yes. I mean, it, it's the it's the hermeneutical equivalent of um, shouting these are the biological facts in people's faces. Um, it's an appeal to. A supposed simplicity that isn't actually there. Things are actually much more complicated and much less uh, comfortingly simple than this kind of view um, makes out. So, so when people say, uh, like you, Nathan, when people say this is what the Bible plainly says, um, I'm always reminded of my own working definition of a fundamentalist. Um, a fundamentalist is someone who takes every word in the Bible literally, apart from this is my body. Um, and this, this is my blood. Um, so, I mean, both Calvin, to, to come back to him, Calvin and Luther both had rather complex theories of the Eucharist in which they went to great lengths to um, argue for a non-literal reading of those words. Now, um, the, the point is not that this is something that you, this is not, the point is not this is special pleading that you put in when you have to, to get away from the plain facts of scripture. The point, is that um, the plain facts of scripture don't really exist. There aren't any plain facts of scripture. It's a matter of understanding things in the light of a wider theological um, outlook that you already have, and which is shaped dialectically in interaction with scripture. And it's just dishonest to pretend that things are that simple. Um, I rather like, I'm, I'm not a great fan of either Luther, Luther or Calvin, but one more word on Calvin. Um, if you read on in Romans, beyond Romans 9, the end of Romans 9, which is where all the Calvinism in the sense of predestination seems to be supposed to come from. If you read on beyond that into Romans 10 and 11, what you actually get is a universalist position. The position is that everyone is going to be saved. And for my part, um, I think that's an ethical necessity. If you believe in predestination, if you believe that God decides in advance um, the way the, the steps that each of us will follow in our life and the choices that we will make in our lives. If you believe that, then you bloody better be a universalist. Because if you believe that God um, predestines anyone to hell, then um, in the words of uh, Ivan Karamazov, I return my ticket. I'm not interested in a God who would create people for the purpose of subjecting them to everlasting torment. That seems to me ethically intolerable. And if that was what Romans was saying, then um, I, I would give up the faith. I would give up uh, the faith like a shot. But fortunately, it isn't what Romans is saying. Actually, Romans is a universalist document, as it has to be consistently, in my view, if it's a predestinarian document, which it is. Um, since it asserts both those do those doctrines, um, few were off the hook. Um, but perhaps the nicest line of all about the scripture is 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 Luther's line about scripture. We go to scripture for the reason that the wise men went to the crib to find Jesus in it. I, I also take the same view of uh, uh, the same reading of Romans as you, but um, I've had a few, you know, does the clay say to the potters levied, levied at me for trying to yeah. <laughs> encourage people down that um, avenue. So I, I just want to say thank you for coming on and answering my questions and taking some questions from the audience. Is there anything that you want to say before we close out or anywhere you'd want to direct people um, where they can read more of your stuff or hear more of you talking on podcasts and so forth? Well, um, I, I'm enormously grateful for your patience in listening to me. Um, I've, got, I've got this book, Transfigured, which, I, I, as I say, I hope will get accepted soon. Um, various bits of it. 
are already on my research page on Academia Edu and on another website called ResearchGate. I never did master fill papers, so I don't have anything except stubs of filled papers. But those things are out there, and <coughs> I'd be I'd be thrilled if people found something that was of value to them in those resources. And uh, just just to say also, um, I'm I'm open for DMs, as they say on Twitter. I'm very happy to talk further about any of these issues. And if people want to push me with further questions, then I'll do my best to respond to them. But thank you for now for your patience. Yeah, no problem. Uh, so yeah, thank you everyone for watching. If you've enjoyed it, be sure to leave a like and uh, leave a comment letting me know what you thought. Or if, you, as well, if you're interested in me having Sophie on again to talk about any other topics, provided you're, you would be interested and have the free time and stuff, I'm sure we could um, set that up. So yeah, I'll end the stream there. See you soon.